Here's one way to think about these higher order questions. They're really boundary questions. So we can ask on this distinction between the objective and the pragmatic, who gets to determine where that boundary lies? Is it an objective matter? Does the objective determine the bounds of the objective and thereby the pragmatic? Or in the end, is it the pragmatic that determines where the boundary is? So we can ask a question of boundaries, a question of adjudication, if you want to put it that way, who has the right to adjudicate any border disputes between the objective and the pragmatic? Now, one way of seeing Brandom's suggestion is that if we're just looking at the two of them, well, we have to go with the pragmatic. But in the end, it is really a social matter. It is mit Dasein that is going to decide where that boundary lies. And so in the end, it's some third thing that is going to establish the boundaries. So in the final analysis, judging that something is objective, that's a social judgment. Judging that something is pragmatic is a social judgment. We might compare it to this situation. In American government, we have three branches of government. We have the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. The grade school idea is that the legislative makes the laws, the executive enforces the laws, and administers the laws, and the judicial branch, well, <laughs> looks at particular cases, but also gets to adjudicate disputes among the other branches. And so we might say that in that framework, a question might be legislative, it might be executive, it might be judicial. But in the end, who establishes the boundaries between the judicial, the legislative, and the executive? Well, the idea, I guess, at least since Marbury versus Madison, is that it's the judicial branch. So. The judicial branch, in a certain sense, is self-adjudicating. It gets to establish its own boundaries. That is not true of the executive or the legislative. They both have to yield to the judicial. Some questions are executive questions, but it's the judicial branch that gets to determine whether or not something is ultimately an executive question. And the same thing is true with, the, with respect to the legislative branch. So that gives us some idea of a way we could think about this distinction. Now, we've got to be careful because these questions aren't always very clear. For example, is it really true that the judicial branch has the right to adjudicate disputes between the legislative and the executive? Well, ordinarily, yes. They, at least since, again, Marbury versus Madison are supposed to. On the other hand, you might think that if the courts get too far out of line, the legislature, and in particular the executive, can simply ignore them. And that's been happening recently in the United States, where court decisions simply get ignored, and where laws on the books simply get ignored. The executive refuses to enforce them. And so we have a system of checks and balances meant to prevent the complete supremacy of one branch over another. But you might say, in an analog to jury nullification, where the jury simply says, yeah, you violated the law, but we don't care. We think it's a bad law, so we're not going to convict you. Um, it turns out that the executive can simply ignore the courts and ignore the legislature when it wants to. It is harder for the legislative branch or the judicial branch to ignore the executive branch, perhaps. Now, I want to go back to philosophy then and think about this sort of question. We might think the basic issue here is one of boundaries. Who gets to set the boundary? Between the analytic and synthetic, who gets to set the boundary? Is it the analytic or the synthetic? Between the a priori and the a posteriori, where does the boundary get set and how? Is it an a priori matter or an a posteriori matter? And there you might say it's not such a question of social institutions or branches of government or even perspectives on the world. It's a matter of, look, um, something is analytic if it's true, or I suppose you could say false if it's analytically false. It has its truth value by virtue of the meanings of its terms. And so you might say it's in the end a linguistic matter, whether something is analytic. Well, then how about that judgment itself? Is it a linguistic matter? Does language, in effect, determine the bounds of the analytic? Or is that something that's part of a larger theory of the world? I think you can see the quine cardap debate as, in a sense, a debate about that. Not really a debate about the legitimacy of the analytic-synthetic distinction so much as a debate about whether that distinction is itself analytic or synthetic. Carnap's position being that the linguistic, the analytic side, gets to determine its own boundaries. It's self-adjudicating.
and Klein disagreeing, saying, no, it's the a posteriori side that is self-adjudicating. And the realm of the analytic gets determined by our overall theories of the world. Well, now, I want to apply this to one particular controversy. You might think that with the analytic and synthetic, or the a priori, a posteriori distinctions, they're very clearly drawn in the sense that a judgment is one or the other and not both. Certainly not both. Okay, either it depends entirely on the meaning of the terms, or it does not. Either it's a question that can be settled independently of experience, or it isn't. It is not so clear, however, with other distinctions. What about the objective and the pragmatic views, for example? Can they overlap? Maybe. What about the issue between, in government, let's say, the legislature and the executive? Are there places where their authorities overlap? Well, depends on how a constitution is written and how practices have evolved, but maybe. What about a particular distinction? It's the distinction that it's at the heart of this dispute between Derrida and Habermas. And it's a question of the bounds between philosophy and literature. Some works we clearly consider works of philosophy. We look at Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, for example, or Descartes' Meditations, or Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, or Heidegger's Being in Time, and we say, no question, these are philosophical works. We look at other works of literature, let's say Shakespeare's plays, or we think about the Iliad and the Odyssey, we think about Virgil's Aeneid, we think about all sorts of poetry in many languages throughout the ages, we think about contemporary novels, all of those seem to fall into the heading of literature. But as soon as we reflect on this a bit, we realize, well, there are things that actually sit kind of on the borderline, and we could debate it, but it seems more natural to say, look, they are, in a sense, both. The short stories of Jorge Luis Borges, for example, or some philosophical novels, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's Nausea, for example, um, or some of his plays, or the novels of Albert Camus, they seem pretty clearly philosophical as well as literary. And so I think it makes sense to say there's actually an overlap here. Now, the distinction then isn't, well, is everything literature or is everything philosophy? Nobody, I think, on either side is really claiming that. What they're claiming is priority for one or the other of these in that sense that Brandom identified. Is the distinction between the philosophical and the literary itself philosophical, or is it literary? So if I am examining a question like W. H. Auden's poem, September 1st, 1939, is this a work of philosophy or a work of literature? I analyze it and I say there are a lot of interesting ideas here, but it's a work of literature. Is that judgment that that poem, September 1st, 1939, is a literary document and not a philosophical is that itself a literary judgment or a philosophical judgment? Now, I think it makes sense in this case to say, well, that's a literary judgment. What about the judgment that Kant's Critique of Pure Reason is a philosophical text? That seems like a philosophical judgment. So in this dispute in particular, you might think, actually, it's philosophy that sets the bounds of philosophy and literature that sets the bounds of literature. And it seems to me that's a perfectly intelligible position. It is not so clear that it's intelligible to say the analytic gets to determine the bounds of the analytic and the synthetic gets to determine the bounds of the synthetic. It might be that that's going to lead to clashes because there can be boundary disputes. They can't each determine the boundary. There's no way for them to overlap. But in the case of literature and philosophy, they can overlap. And so it's okay. Some things might get included in both sets. Some things might get excluded from both. That's just fine. And so we might think there's not really much of an issue here, but both Derrida and Habermas think that there is. So let's try to be more precise. Jacques Derrida maintains that literature has primacy over philosophy. What does he mean by that? Well, in part, at least, that the judgment of whether something is a literary or a philosophical text is itself a literary question, that it is scholars of literature and readers of literature who classify September 1st, 1939, is a literary text, and the Critique of Pure Reason as a philosophical text. The boundary between the two gets to be set from the side of literature. Literature is self-adjudicating. It determines its own boundaries. Nothing else has quite that same status. Everything else is dependent on literature 
for a delimitation of its particular domain. Well, Habermas thinks that's a mistake. <laughs> he basically says, there is a romantic model of artistic ecstasy here that he sees in Nietzsche, in Heidegger, and in Derrida, and that he thinks is a kind of mistake. It involves a sort of primacy of the artistic as opposed to the objective that Habermas objects to. So you can imagine him objecting as well to this idea that the ready to hand is really primary over the objective. He's arguing, no, 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 this is a romantic idea that is some kind of mistake. The ecstatic power of linguistic innovation is thus abstracted in this romantic spirit into the irrationality of the timeless, of overpowering the contingent. It assigns a cognitively blind aesthetic experience primacy over knowledge and moral insight, over discursive processes in general. I think we can see Habermas here as arguing that Derrida is wrong about the boundary question. Philosophy determines the boundaries of philosophy. Now it might be that literature also gets to determine its own boundaries. I don't think Habermas is particularly interested in denying that, but he does want to say that there are certain modes of discourse, philosophical ones, but also presumably scientific ones, economic ones, and so on, that get to determine their own boundaries too. Is such and such a question for economics or a question of philosophy? Well, Habermas says it's really up to the economists whether something is an economic question, up to the philosophers whether it's a philosophical question. It is not up to the literary critics, which is, as he interprets at least, Derrida's position. Now, whether that is Derrida's position or not, and that's controversial, plenty of Derrida scholars disagree with Habermas on this point, but still, I think there's an intriguing issue here. Who gets to determine basic disciplinary boundaries? In Habermas's view, anyway, Derrida is arguing that the literary takes precedence over the philosophical and over these other fields, that it gets to determine the boundaries. So literature is not only self-adjudicating, it adjudicates the boundaries of philosophy and of various other disciplines. In the end, all of those involve writing, and so all of them are adjudicated by literature, according to Derrida. So the question here really is whether that kind of aesthetic approach to writing in general, to text, to the spoken word as well, is something that takes primacy, or whether certain disciplines and certain modes of inquiry can claim autonomy for themselves. So one way of phrasing this is as a boundary question. One way of phrasing it is in terms of adjudicating these disputes on the boundary. And another way of thinking about it is, are certain disciplines autonomous, or are they in some way dependent on literature for their very definition and boundaries? Derrida, on this interpretation anyway, is thinking of literature as the one that is primary in the sense that everything else is delimited by it denying other fields autonomy. It would only be literature on that view that is truly autonomous. If Habermas is right, on the other hand, philosophy and science and economics and so on all have a kind of autonomy as well. They get to determine their own boundaries and things can overlap, uh, which is fine from that point of view. It's fine on the other point of view too. By the way, the literature person can say, Yes, this is a work of philosophy and a work of literature. So the possibility of overlap does not decide this. And what we're raising here is an interesting question. How do you go about deciding this dispute? How do we decide disputes like those between Quine and Carnap, the advocate of the analytic or the advocate of the synthetic, the advocate of the a priori, the advocate of the a posteriori? Is the a priori autonomous or is it dependent on the a posteriori? Is the analytic autonomous? Or is it dependent on the synthetic? Is philosophy autonomous? Or is it dependent on literature? Again, not dependent in all ways, not that it becomes just a branch of literature or anything like that, but rather that its authority, its boundaries, are determined by something outside of itself. To conclude, I think the issue that Brandon sees in Heidegger is an extraordinarily important issue. If we look at that issue between the objective and the pragmatic, and their relation to broadly social categorization, or if we look at the habermas Derrida debate and think about the boundaries between literature and philosophy, we recognize these questions of boundaries, of adjudication, of autonomy, are ones that really do have important 
implications descriptively for how we understand certain disciplines, normatively for how they ought to be conducted, and how we ought to think about the ways in which they can or cannot determine their own boundaries. It also suggests something about methodology. Really, what does one do in investigating philosophical questions or in pragmatic or objective questions? What are those things all about? So it has some important implications, and it's really about the ability of one discipline, one mode of understanding the world, to adjudicate questions that concern the domain of another sort of discipline about the world. It has to do with the ways in which our discursive practices fit together in the broadest sense. And so I think if we reflect on it from this point of view, we can see that the overall shape of our being in the world really does depend on the shape of our modes of understanding the world, and that depends on these kinds of higher order.